Hey guys, the labor movement really coincides more with industrialization than anything else in the United States, but I don't want you to think that no one ever organized before the Gilded Age, because that would be untrue. In fact, we had something called craft unions as early as the late 1700s, even though craft unions didn't really make a giant mark in business history until probably the mid 1800s. What is a craft union, also called a trade union? That's simply an organization of skilled workers who come together around one craft, one trade, not necessarily one employer. So what these guys do in the mid 1800s is impact wages. And I can demonstrate that for you by looking at one company in particular that is going to be pretty important when talking about a landmark event in labor history that you need to at least be aware of. To understand this one company that we're going to examine, you should know that Cyrus McCormick invented the Mechanical Reaper in the early 1800s. And this was a game changer for farmers because it made them more productive with less labor. By 1856, McCormick was selling 4,000 plus reapers per year. And these reapers were manufactured in Chicago, Illinois. You should know factory wages throughout the 1850s often fluctuated during times of peak demand, but would go down again when that peak demand had ended. And that was often seasonal because of when farmers were buying reapers. Despite seasonal spikes, you should know that the overall trend in this factory was one of steady wage decline. You might immediately wonder, why'd that happen? Well, that's a complicated answer because economics is complicated. But to just be super general, automation and specialization, which decreased the number of skilled laborers you needed, made some impact on wages. Also, there was another simple factor that we can address. Immigration spiked hugely in the United States in the 1850s. We're talking triple. You should understand that at least to some extent, the cost of labor cannot be completely divorced from supply and demand principles that work within a free market. The more labor you have, the less it's worth. Of course, the same principle works in reverse. In the 1860s, you see the Civil War break out in the United States. This is a bloody, horrible, terrible conflict that involves drafts for both the Union and the Confederacy. So you have a lot of workers in Chicago turn into soldiers, which decreased the number of laborers you had. So, of course, the worth of labor goes up. But our story is more complicated than that because we're talking about trade unions, craft unions, and the role they had to play in the labor movement. The Local 23 was the dominant craft union at McCormick, and it maintained limited membership for journeyman molders. These skilled laborers made up around 10% of the McCormick workforce, and they increased wages outside of supply demand principles, which is why they are worth looking at. From a company clerk's letter dated April 11th, 1864, we know a little bit about how these guys were impacting the company. Quote, we may incidentally mention our molders are going on their fourth strike for an advance of wages since last fall. They now want 25% more. We wish we could help it, but we are powerless. End quote. What should you get from that? Trade unions, craft unions could be extremely effective in various factories for their various members before the labor movement really got going. Uh, the truth of the matter is, there are not a lot of people who are organized even throughout the Gilded Age. The labor movement doesn't really reach its heyday until the early 20th century. We're still in the nascent phase. Having said that, the first national labor union is formed after the Local 23 was at work at McCormick's. Well, I talk briefly about this organization elsewhere in this video series that I've made for you, 
the first labor union that is national that anyone really cares about is the Knights of Labor. Now to understand these guys, you should realize the union was formed around an ideology that was imported from Europe because of all the immigrants who were leaving labor strife in countries like Germany. You can imagine that there are going to be various strains of thought that some Americans will view as quite radical. For example, a lot of the leaders are influenced by anarchism or and Marxism. The KOL reaches the height of its power with the most members in 1886. However, it will be at this point that a backlash against unions in general will take place, and that will be inspired by an event that is related once more to our little factory, the McCormick Harvesting Company. This brings us to the Haymarket you Affair. You already know there had been plenty of strikes at McCormick before the 1880s. But by the 1880s, the Knights of Labor are also engaged with McCormick. It's not just that craft union, the trade union, the local 23. And an old cause has come to the forefront again. Way back in the 1860s, the local 23 had led a strike against McCormick asking for an eight hour work day for not just themselves, but everyone in the factory. And in fact, it was a, an everyone in the factory walkout. And management at that time had dealt with this by giving everyone in the factory a raise to stay for 10 hours. So, okay, you got more money, but you didn't reduce the, the amount of time that you were laboring away. Well, by 1886, some workers at McCormick go on strike because they again want an eight hour work day. And this will be with the support of some of the Knights. What was the consequence? Well, pretty immediately, a lot of workers got fired. And then you had strike breakers who were hired because that was kind of the modus operandi of the day as McCormick is gonna try and break the strike because they don't wanna do this eight hour um, construct. So then on May 1st, a whole bunch of different unions uh, get together and people who are in support of labor have a peaceful parade through the city of Chicago. May 1st is now May Day in part related to well, this. The strike over at McCormick is still going on. And what takes place soon after the parade, just a couple days later, is the police get into an altercation with the strikers and one of the strikers ends up dead. What? So police brutality is now on display and people are angry about that. So you have a gathering in Haymarket Square on May 4th, 1886. It attracts uh, almost a couple thousand people, which is a good little crowd in this period. And things are quite peaceful and you have speeches. It's a regular rally. And of course, Americans have the right to gather and protest things that happen within society. Unfortunately, things go wrong. It was a gray, cold Chicago day. So after a little while, a lot of the crowd starts to disperse and go home and you end up having the just kind of small little pockets of protesters and the police come in to say to them, go, you know, move along, move along, go home now. And unfortunately, when this takes place, someone takes a pipe bomb and throws it at one of the police officers and this makes everything explode into what is now known as the Haymarket Riot. Ultimately, seven police officers die, along with four civilians in the crowd. And this is going to create a public backlash against the whole labor movement. People in America believe that you need calm to conduct commerce. And if you have movements that disrupt the calm, those movements are bad. That was the general thought. So no one knew who had actually thrown the pipe bomb, but they did know who a lot of the leaders within the movement were, who were more radical in nature, who had an ideology that seemed foreign. A lot of them were 
foreign immigrants. So the Chicago Eight end up getting arrested and they are put on trial in what we can't say was a fair circumstance. The judge was biased against them. I think that's pretty clear. The jurors were not really a group of their peers because the prosecutors made sure to strike out anyone who had any sympathies for the labor movement. And ultimately, four, four of these men end up being hung, even though there wasn't really good evidence that they had killed the policemen or incited the riot themselves. The Chicago 8 became the poster boys for systemic oppression if you were engaged in the labor union movement. Even today, there are anarcho-syndicalists who will look back at the Chicago 8 and hold them up to show you injustices within the American system. And that's fair. You should absolutely think about what happened to these men, but you need to also know that the Haymarket riot killed the Knights of Labor. Why was that again? Here's my thesis. The general American public had a violent reaction to violence in the streets, and it's all about who they blame for that violence. You might also ask, did the labor movement itself also die? No, of course not. Labor still had lots of problems that needed to be addressed. So you just kind of had it change. On one hand, you're gonna see rise up unions like the AFL, the American Federation of Labor, that kind of take some lessons from the craft unions. And people like Samuel Gompers who lead the AFL will ask for incremental changes from capital so that you can work within the system and still improve the worker's life. On the other hand, you have a lot of those radical thinkers who had been in the nights not disappear but reform in another union called the IWW or International Workers of the World. These guys are sometimes referred to as the wobblies because you can bop them in the face and they'll fall down for half a second and then come back up and bop you back. So AFL one hand, IWW on the other hand, and the labor movement will grow as we go into the 20th century.